This evening will be the fourth Raymond Williams Memorial Lecture. The trust which has organized four of these memorial lectures invites someone who they feel is working in the spirit of Raymond Williams or whose work uh, uh, he would have wished to see encouraged and honored. And so far, um, we've had four of the annual lectures and also in the spirit of Raymond Williams, we've organized some outside London. Uh, in fact, there have been three outside London and four of the annual lectures here uh, in London uh, itself. Um, previous givers of the memorial lecture have been Edward Said, Gwynalf Williams, Marina Warner, and outside London, Umberto Echo, Terry Eagleton, and Stuart Hall, who've given lectures in Glasgow, Kiel, and Cardiff. Um, well, this evening, it's our very great pleasure and honor to introduce Noam Chomsky to give this fourth memorial lecture. And I, I would just like to say a little bit, uh, not because Noam Chomsky needs any introduction, but because we do feel that he is extraordinarily well placed to give this memorial lecture, and we do feel that uh, uh, in inviting him to do so, we are encouraging precisely the type of courageous public intervention of which Raymond Williams so warmly approved and which he himself uh, also undertook. Uh, I, I think I should say to begin with that we also perhaps felt that there was even some affinity in the work of Raymond Williams and Noam Chomsky even though it, it, it is in different fields. And I suppose it would be this that in the work of both of these great scholars, one does see a commitment to the extraordinary potential that lies in ordinary people. And one can see that this can give rise either to great work of cultural criticism uh, or, uh, in the case of Professor Chomsky, uh, to his uh, 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 innovative uh, uh, revolutionary work in the field of linguistics. But um, this commitment to the potential of ordinary people is something that also naturally grows over into a critical, vigilant stance against the arrogance of power and against the corruption of all the channels of communication, discussion, and public debate, which is such a ominous feature of public life, not only in um, Britain, but also in the United States. Raymond Williams, of course, himself put forward bold proposals for democratizing the media, not by enlarging the power of the state, but by empowering people from below, uh, and by empowering communicators and releasing them from the tutelage uh, of commercial interests and uh, of uh, the interests of power holders. I think Raymond Williams saw this as a particularly key area because he felt that democracy itself, democratic life, was in danger of atrophying in its formal bodies, in parliament, uh, in congress, uh, and, and other such institutions. And that's why he put such great emphasis on the need for a democratic revitalization of the means of communication. And that's why he himself also uh, participated as a public intellectual, a responsible intellectual, speaking out on the great issues of the day. Well, it need hardly be said that uh, Noam Chomsky has been doing that and doing that uh, uh, for more than three decades. Um, many of us remember his tremendous essays at the time of the um, Vietnam War and the huge role he played in gradually awakening a critical spirit, uh, even in the most unlikely places in the United States uh, in the late 60s, the middle and late 60s. In subsequent decades, and including on occasions when um, 
the going was even more difficult. Noam has been a vigilant eye and um, a strong voice against oppression, injustice, above all the oppression and injustice supported by his own government, or the government that is to say of the United States and by the West more generally. In Nicaragua, and perhaps one should mention most recently and memorably for all of us, the occasion uh, two years ago when the governments of the United States and Britain unleashed the Gulf War. Now, in Britain, as in the United States, we're just passing through a period where through a chapter of accidents, through events entirely outside the control of the government, um, a court case has gone wrong, and apparently it's discovered to great amazement that uh, the British government was covertly breaking its own supposed embargo on the dictator Saddam Hussein, uh, against whom it launched uh, that ferocious attack. And um, of course, at the time it was arming Saddam Hussein, it was perfectly well known uh, that he'd been gassing Kurds, uh, oppressing uh, uh, oppositionists inside his own country. I think many of you may remember Noam Chomsky's splendid essay that was printed in, our, in, in The Guardian in the run-up to the Gulf War, which exposed this and many other hypocrisies long before we've had the confirmation which has uh, so lately arrived. Well, uh, I don't wish to say any more by way of introduction. I know that um, Noam Chomsky is speaking tonight on the year 501. I think this is a reference to uh, the first year after the 500th centenary of Christopher Columbus, uh, which has been marked by many of us as an event which shows the dark side of the spread of the West and its global power and influence, uh, and which also requires of us a critical spirit well, uh, 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 I'm also pleased to say that Noam Chomsky's book, Deterring Democracy, uh, is now available in paperback, and I think even some copies can be uh, purchased at the door. Uh, I think that the title of the lecture he has chosen this evening is linked to the theme of his next book. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Noam Chomsky. <laughs> I was going to talk about the 501st year of modern philosophy, but I guess I better shift given what you just said. Uh, the, uh, the year 1992 uh, poses a critical moral and cultural challenge for the more privileged sectors of the world dominant societies, as, of course, as Robin mentioned, we enter year 501 of the European conquest of the world. And how that challenge is addressed, I think, is likely to have quite fateful consequences. Uh, in recent years, the subjugation of the, the South, as it's now euphemistically called, the subjugation of the South has intensified. The gap between the rich and the poor has doubled since 1960. This is largely a consequence of the neoliberal policies that are have been imposed on the traditional colonies. Uh, while 20 out of 24 industrial countries are more protectionist today than they were a decade ago. Uh, the World Bank has recently estimated that the protectionist measures of the industrial countries, which are keeping pace with their free market bombast, uh, reduce the, nat the national income of the South by twice the amount of official so-called development assistance, which is itself a form of export promotion. Uh, the South Commission may call for a new world order, as they called it, that will respond, quoting, to the South's plea for justice, equity, and democracy in the global society. But that plea is sure to remain unanswered, short of major changes where, powers, where power lies. What will be heard and has been heard uh, is the vision of the new world order uh, uh, of George Bush, who borrowed the same phrase a few months later uh, as part of the rhetorical cover for the US, British, 
uh, war in the Gulf. This is the new imperial age, as the Financial Times recently called it, uh, with a global system, paraphrasing the Financial Times, a global system orchestrated by the group of seven, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, the GATT, and their corporate financial constituencies, uh, a major feature of the era that we are now entering. Now, by the term Europe, when I speak of Europe's conquest of the world, I, of course, mean to include the English settled colonies, one of which now leads the crusade, uh, and also the Japanese. I borrow here South African usage and describe the Japanese as honorary whites, uh, rich enough to almost qualify, at least. Uh, Japan was one of the few parts of the South uh, that joined the core with core industrial societies with some of its former colonies in its wake, having been able to avoid the doctrines that are applied to ensure the subordination of the traditional colonies, which are sometimes called free trade or structural adjustment or our noble ideals, uh, from which we, of course, are exempt and always have been. Uh, Adam Smith took the discovery of America and that of a passage to the East Indies, quoting to be the two greatest and most important events recorded in the history of mankind, which certainly made a most essential contribution to the state of Europe, opening up a new and inexhaustible market that led to vast expansion of productive powers and real revenue and wealth, so quoting. In theory, he said, the new set of exchanges should naturally have proved as advantageous to the new as it certainly did to the old continent, but that was not to be. The savage injustice of the Europeans rendered an event which ought to have been beneficial to all, ruinous and destructive to the conquered people who suffered dreadful misfortunes, uh, Smith wrote, he revealing himself to be an early practitioner of the crime of political correctness to borrow some of the terminology of contemporary cultural management. Uh, he went on to point out that their superiority of force enabled the Europeans to commit with impunity every sort of injustice. One case that he found particularly appalling was Bengal, a rich and fertile country with advanced manufacturing when the British arrived, already devastated by Smith's day in 1776. Uh, hundreds of thousands die of famine in a single year, he wrote, because of the conditions imposed by the conquerors, which turned dearth into a famine, while officials of the honorable company plow up a rich field of rice or other grain in order to make room for a plantation of poppies for the opium trade, which was one prime source of the huge profits that stimulated the first industrial revolution, along with the lucrative slave trade and robbery of the colonies generally. Uh, these Smith's conclusions a couple hundred years ago are quite well supported by contemporary scholarship. Europeans fought to kill and they had, a, they had the means to satisfy their bloodlust. In the American colonies, the natives were astonished by the savagery of the Spanish and particularly the British. Uh, meanwhile, on the other side of the world, the peoples of Indonesia were equally appalled by the all destructive fury of European warfare quoting all this from a contemporary military historian, Jeffrey Parker. Uh, Europeans regarded all the conquests as small wars, he comments. Its domination of the world relied critically upon the constant use of force. It was thanks to their military superiority rather than to any social, moral, or natural advantage that the white peoples of the world managed to create and control, however briefly, the first global hegemony in history. Those temporal qualifications, in my opinion, are open to question. Well, the consequences of what Adam Smith called the savage injustice of the Europeans are not in doubt, including the two worst demographic catastrophes in history and a record of devastation and oppression that continues until the present day. The grim truth has been kept quite remote from consciousness and with remarkable efficiency to this day uh, among educated sectors. One example that's been quite well studied is their reaction to the Pol Pot style atrocities that were directed by the United States in its own backyard in recent years as it conducted a violent war against the church and other miscreants who sought to bring a measure of freedom and justice 
to one of the most brutalized corners of the world. Uh, outside of more disciplined circles, however, the cultural awakening of the 1960s opened many eyes, a fact which has aroused much fury among the commissars. Uh, it's worth taking a moment to inspect the wonders of the commissar culture, uh, highlighted, in fact, by this current example. There's now a solemn debate in progress about the U.S. dedication to, as it's called, exporting democracy. It was supposed to have been the guiding doctrine of the Reagan administration. Uh, sober thinkers warn that, quoting, by granting idealism a near exclusive hold on our foreign policy, we go too far, harming our own interests. It's New York Times chief diplomatic correspondent Thomas Friedman quoting high officials. Uh, there's no confusion about the operative meaning of democracy or how the grand victory was won. Uh, all of this was revealed with great clarity uh, after the end of the Cold War removed any residual appeal to this uh, alleged interference with the awesome nobility of our, of our purpose. Keeping just to Central America, as the, cent as the Berlin Wall fell, uh, elections were held in Honduras in what George Bush called an inspiring example of the democratic promise that is today spreading throughout the Americas. Uh, there were two candidates. They both represented large landowners and wealthy industrialists with close ties to the military, who were the effective rulers under U.S. control. Uh, they had no political programs, so the campaign was largely restricted to insults and entertainment rather like another campaign that had taken place somewhere not long before. Uh, human rights abuses by the security forces escalated before the election. Uh, starvation and misery are rampant, having increased uh, considerably during the decade of democracy, as it's called, along with capital flight and the debt burden, but there was no major threat to order or to investors. Uh, at the same time, same month, the electoral campaign opened in Nicaragua. Uh, its 1984 elections do not exist in U.S. commentary. They could not be controlled, and therefore they are not an inspiring example of democracy. Uh, taking no chances with the long-scheduled 1990 elections, Bush announced at once in uh, November 1989 that only a victory for his candidate would end the embargo that was strangling the country. The White House and Congress then proceeded to renew their support for the Contra terrorists in defiance of the Central American President, the World Court, and the United Nations, which had been rendered irrelevant by the uh, U.S. Security Council uh, veto. Uh, Nicaraguans were thus informed, very explicitly, that only a vote for the U.S. candidate would end the terror and the illegal economic warfare. The intellectual class in the United States and Britain and other places went along, uh, continuing to suppress the U.S. subversion of the peace process with the diligence that's required on important affairs of state. Uh, I did a review of the press in Latin America and the United States, and it was kind of interesting. In Latin America, the electoral outcome was generally described as a victory for George Bush, even by those who celebrated it. In the United States, in contrast, the outcome was hailed as, a couple of quotes, victory for U.S. fair play, with Americans united in joy, kind of Albanian style. Uh, that's New York Times headlines. Now, it's not that, and that was typical all over the press, no exceptions. Uh, it's not that the celebrants were unaware of how the U.S. victory was achieved. Rather, there was just unconstrained joy at the grand success in subverting democracy. So here's Time Magazine, for example. It was quite frank about the means that were employed to bring about what they called the, the, happy, the latest of the happy series of democratic surprises as democracy burst forth in Nicaragua. The method, they said, was, I'm quoting, to wreck the economy and prosecute a long and deadly proxy war until the exhausted natives overthrow the unwanted government themselves with a cost to us that is minimal leaving the victim with wrecked bridges, sabotaged power stations, and ruined farms, and thus providing the U.S. candidate with a winning issue, ending the impoverishment of the people of Nicaragua. 
Uh, well, to appreciate the character of the political culture, it's only necessary to take the same phrase, uh, imagine it appearing in Stalinist Russia with a few names changed, uh, an intellectual exercise which is far beyond the capacity of Western commissars, needless to say. Uh, but uh, let's leave that morass and turn to some other ones. Uh, as the quincentenary approached, the traditional apologetics uh, were sounded once again, and they're not entirely without merit, so it takes a, the economist in London. It had a point when it uh, lauded uh, what it called the passion for justice of the Spanish murderers and torturers. It is, in fact, true that they wanted to keep some of their victims alive to slave in the mines, where their life expectancy was about the same as that of forced laborers at Auschwitz, uh, as historian David Stannard observes. And he compares this more humane attitude with that of the English settlers seeking Lebensraum. Uh, their goal was simply to rid themselves of the natives entirely as they carried out what uh, the leading newspaper in the United States in the mid-19th century called the glorious work of subjugation and, and conquest. Uh, one of the leading heroes uh, whose name now graces the capital city of Texas, explained that the American colonists would be satisfied with nothing short of extermination or expulsion. The U.S. would soon sweep the country of the Indians and drive them, as they always have driven them, to ruin and extermination, Stephen Austin explained. He was speaking to what he called the madmen who sought to establish a free red-white society in Texas, uh, where he had already successfully cleared those he called the natives of the forest. Uh, there were people more humane than Stephen Austin, like George Washington, uh, who felt that, in his words, the gradual extension of our settlements will as certainly cause the savage as the wolf to retire, both being beasts of prey, though they differ in shape. Thomas Jefferson advised that the backward tribes at the borders will relapse into barbarism and misery lose numbers by war and want, and we shall be obliged to drive them with the beasts of the forests into the stony mountains. Uh, meanwhile, all blacks would be removed to Africa, uh, uh, Jefferson said, leaving the country without blot or mixture, uh, or to Haiti, which Abraham Lincoln recognized in 1862 in part for the same reason. Uh, a modern rendition of all of this is given by a contemporary standard history of American diplomacy published in 1969, Thomas Bailey, uh, where we read that after winning their independence, Americans concentrated on the task of felling trees and Indians and of rounding out their, natu their natural boundaries. Well, like Adam Smith, Thomas Jefferson was a man of enlightenment and humanity, representing the heights of European civilization. Exploring further, we reach the great thinker who discoursed authoritatively on the same topics in his lectures on philosophy of history a half a century later in 1830, as we approach what he called the final phase of world history, when spirit reaches its full maturity and strength in the German world, German includes England. Uh, speaking from these lofty heights, uh, Hegel explains that Native America was physically and psychically powerless, so that it must expire as soon as spirit approached it. Hence, the Aborigines gradually vanished at the breath of European activity. According to him, they were inferior even to the Negroes, whose character has nothing harmonious with humanity. Entirely lacking in moral sentiments, they practice polygamy, so as to have many children to sell into slavery, which is a benevolent institution, enabling them to become participant in a higher morality and the culture connected with it. They have such contempt of humanity, he said, that they allow themselves to be shot down by thousands in war with Europeans. Life has a value only when it has something valuable as its object, which is a thought beyond the, the grasp of creatures who are at the level of a mere thing, uh, an object of no value. Uh, such thoughts persist right to the present day. Liberal critics of the Vietnam War explained that the Asian poor used the strategy of the weak, inviting us to carry our strategic logic to its conclusion, which is genocide. 
but we are unwilling to destroy ourselves by contradicting our own value system. Uh, soft humanitarians, we feel that genocide is a terrible burden to bear, uh, William Pfaff and Townsend Hoops explain. Just a couple of weeks ago, strategic analyst Albert Volstetter added that the Vietnamese were able to bear the costs imposed on their subjects more easily than we could impose them ideas that were just too noble for this cruel world. Uh, while Hegel lectured on the psychic disorders that caused the natives to expire as spirit approached, President Andrew Jackson announced his Indian Removal Act uh, and explained that he was deeply moved by his generosity in having done my duty to my red children, uh, namely by expelling them, expelling the civilized tribes, uh, who had in fact created a remarkably successful and productive self-governing society after having been brutally expelled uh, in violation of other equally solemn treaties. Uh, if, any if any failure of my good intention arises, Jackson said, it will be attributable to their lack, to their want of duty to themselves, not to me. Uh, his lucky children were then driven at bayonet point on what they called the Trail of Tears, uh, perhaps half survived the generous and enlightened policy of the U.S. government as the operation was described by the Secretary of War with the routine self-acclaim for unspeakable atrocities. Now, there was an eyewitness observer who described how the pioneers deprived the Indians of their rights and exterminated them with singular felicity, tranquilly, legally, philanthropically, without shedding blood, and without violating a single great principle of morality in the eyes of the world. It was impossible to destroy people with more respect for the laws of humanity, uh, de Tocqueville wrote on the scene. Uh, nothing reveals this remarkable capacity more dramatically than the Western reaction to the Indochina Wars, which are in fact one of the most savage episodes of the 500-year conquest. They left millions of corpses, three countries utterly devastated, children being killed to this day by unexploded bombs, deformed fetuses in hospitals in the South, notice not the North, which was spared the particular atrocity of chemical warfare. From this record, one issue remains, the savage treatment of the United States at the hands of the Vietnamese barbarians. You get it day after day in the press today, for example. In the New York Times, we read stories with headlines like, Vietnam trying to be nicer still has a long way to go, with Asia correspondent Barbara Crosset reporting that although the Vietnamese are making some progress on the missing Americans, they're still far from approaching our moral standards. And there's a hundred others with the same tone and content. Pretty soon Clinton will be in the act. Uh, properly statesmanlike, President Bush a few days ago announced that it was a bitter conflict, but Hanoi knows today that we seek only answers without the threat of retribution for the past. In other words, their crimes against us can never be forgotten, but we can begin, he said, writing the last chapter of the Vietnam War if they dedicate themselves with sufficient zeal to locating the remains of Americans who they viciously blasted from the skies. Uh, we might even begin helping the Vietnamese find and identify their own combatants missing in action, Croset adds, and we perhaps might even lift the embargo that's strangling Vietnam. Uh, that is, if American businessmen feel that they're being cut out of potential profits, which is the only serious issue. Uh, the adjacent, that was a story on the front page of the New York Times. Right next to it, there was another one, which reported the visit of the Japanese emperor to China where he failed to unambiguously accept the blame for Japan's wartime aggression. That revealed again a deep flaw in the Japanese character that has very sorely puzzled American commentators in the past year as they commemorated the date which will live in infamy, namely a day when Japan attacked a naval base in a U.S. colony that had been stolen from its inhabitants by force and guile. Uh, loyalists elsewhere uh, insist on greater vulgarity, for example, in England, uh, where you can find people like Robert Conquest, uh, who mocks reports of U.S. directed atrocities as the sheerest absurdity. Uh, perhaps the silliest, he wrote, 
1986 was a solemn declaration by, I'm quoting him, by a leading figure in Oxfam that he had evidence showing that the Contras in Nicaragua had committed various atrocities, especially against medical and educational staff, something that would obviously have no possible motive, he explained, and is therefore transparently vulgar propaganda. Uh, five months before he wrote, an on-the-scene inquiry of 120 health professionals of the American Public Health Association and the World Health Organization had reported that the Contras were, I'm quoting, systematically destroying hospitals and clinics and killing and terrorizing healthcare workers, giving many details. Uh, human rights investigators have provided a horrendous and detailed record. Uh, as for the reasons, those who are too stupid to be able to figure them out for themselves could turn for assistance to the CIA, the State Department, and the U.S. Southern Command, uh, who explained quite clearly why the Contras were directed to attack what were called soft targets, meaning, meaning undefended civilian targets. Uh, the former head of intelligence of the main Contra force who defected described his training illegally in a U.S. Air Force base, uh, and he explained how the Contras there were trained, in his words, to attack a lot of schools, health centers, and those sorts of things. We have tried to make it so that the Nicaraguan government cannot provide social services for the peasants, cannot develop its projects, uh, in other words, to ensure that scarce resources are, are diverted to military expenditures, as the CIA put it in an internal July 1983 assessment, three years before Con Conquest explained uh, his perspective. Uh, some of the commentary in the British press on the latest Nobel Prize given to Rigoberta Menchu really surpasses belief. Uh, sometimes when I read the British press, I must say I think there's something subtle going on that I don't understand, that, uh, you know, too subtle for us colonials to catch or something. Anyhow, I'll quote, if, if, if I'm misunderstanding, explain it to me. Uh, the, the tele, uh, this from the Telegraph. Uh, they concede that the Guatemalan army did massacre Indian populations and drive them out of their country, but I'm quoting, it is the left-wing terror tactics that have plagued the Americas for more than 100 years, not the genocidal operations of the slaughterers and the torturers, or of course their paymasters and directors who remain unmentioned in polite society. The ideological movement of the guerrillas posed a much greater danger to the way of life of the Highland Indians in Guatemala than the brutish but fitful intrusions of the military regime. That's from the journal's Central American Specialist. Uh, you can find such things elsewhere. If you go down to the depths of the Stalinist archives, you can find things similar to these performances, which are quite regularly in the press. Uh, in fact, traditionally, the British have been able to compete with the best in this game. Uh, Lord Cromer explained that the British possess in a very high degree the power of acquiring the sympathy and confidence of the primitive races with, it, with which they are brought into contact. His colleague, Lord Curzon, who was the Viceroy of India, proclaimed that in the empire we have found not merely the key to glory and wealth, but the call to duty and the means of service to mankind. In fact, heaven must be full to overflowing if the masters of self-adulation are to be taken at their word. Uh, for some odd reason, the subject peoples find strange ways to express their gratitude. So Nehru, for example, who is incidentally quite an Anglophile, uh, wrote that the only possible parallel to the Viceroy of India would be that of Hitler. The ideology of British rule, he wrote, was that of the heron folk and the master race, an idea inherent in imperialism that was proclaimed in unambiguous language by those in authority and manifested in practice as Indians were subjected to insult, humiliation, and contemptuous treatment. Uh, writing from a British prison in 1944, Nehru was not unmindful of the benevolent intent of the rulers. The solicitude with which British industrialists and economists have shown for the Indian peasant, he wrote, has been truly gratifying. In view of this, as well as of the tender care lavished upon him by the British government in India, one can only conclude that some all-powerful and malign fate, some supernatural agency, has countered their intentions and measures and made that peasant one of the poorest and most miserable beings on earth. 
He also points out that you can draw quite a good correlation between the length of British rule in various areas and the impoverishment of the population. Uh, there are others who've been less genteel in their commentary, although Western culture, which has the guns and the wealth, remains largely immune. The shameful record, if considered at all, is regarded as insignificant or even a proof of our nobility. And it's here that the moral and cultural challenge arises at the end of the first 500 years of this story, which is sure to continue. Uh, one striking feature of the European conquest has been the leading role of state power and violence. There's a lot of very good contemporary scholarship on this. Summarizing uh, a lot of it, James Tra starring James Tracy writes that Europeans broke violently into relatively open Asian trading systems, organizing their major commercial ventures either as an extension of the state or as autonomous trading companies which were endowed with many of the characteristics of the state and in fact were backed by the centralized power of the home country. The English were particularly efficient, which is why Britain won the game. The booty that was brought home by Sir Francis Drake and other pirates may fairly be considered the fountain and origin of British foreign investments, John Maynard Keynes wrote laying the basis, he pointed out, of the, for the investments that were the main foundations of England's foreign connections. By the mid-17th century, England was powerful enough to impose an effective trading monopoly in the North Atlantic while driving its rivals from India, where state power was used to quite good effect. A 20th century British Royal Industrial Commission recalled that Indian industrial development was, quoting, not inferior to that of the more advanced European nations when merchant adventurers from the West arrived. It may even be that the uh, industries of India were far more advanced than those in the West up to the advent of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, economic historian Frederick Claremont points out, citing British studies on that matter. From 1700, Britain barred Indian textiles uh, later forcing India to take inferior British products. Other advanced in, in Indian industries were also undermined, including shipbuilding, glass, paper, and others. India became rural, uh, ruralized and impoverished, an agricultural colony of industrial England. Uh, such measures were unavoidable. Uh, Horace Wilson, a friend of James Mills, wrote in his History of British India, 1826, uh, had this not been the case, the mills of Paisley and Manchester would have been stopped in their outset and could scarcely have been again set in motion even by the power of steam. They were created by the sacrifice of Indian manufacturers. In 1757, as he conquered Bengal, Clive described the textile center of Dhaka as extensive, populous, and rich as the city of London. By 1840, its population had fallen from 150,000 to 30,000. Uh, Sir Charles Trevelyan testified before a committee of the House of Lords, quoting him, and the jungle and malaria are fast encroaching. Dhaka, the Manchester of India, has fallen from a very flourishing town to a very poor and small town. It's now, of course, the capital of Bangladesh, the very symbol of hopelessness and despair, much like Haiti, which was the wealthiest colonial possession in the Americas, producing three quarters of the world's sugar by 1789, also leading the world in production of coffee, cotton, and other resources, providing France with enormous wealth from the labor of its roughly half million slaves, and later completely devastated in large measure as retribution for its successful slave revolt as the savage injustice of the Europeans took its course continuing until the present day. It's going on right now. Uh, under Britain's permanent settlement of 1793, uh, the lands of India were privatized, modern <coughs> touch to that. Uh, that yielded wealth to local clients and taxes for the British rulers, while, quoting, the settlement fashioned with great care and deliberation has to our painful knowledge subjected almost the whole of the lower classes to most grievous oppression. It's a British Inquiry Commission in 1832. The director of the East India Company reported that the misery hardly finds a parallel in the history of commerce. The bones of cotton weavers are bleaching the plains of India. 
Uh, note that the experiment was a failure only for the experimental subjects who, as far as I recall, were not asked to sign consent forms. Uh, but those who designed the experiment, uh, uh, for them it worked very well. In fact, typically the experiments that are carried out, the, the experimental subjects don't even have the rights of laboratory animals, who at least are considered sub subject to certain ethical requirements. Uh, by the 19th century, India was financing more than two-fifths of Britain's trade deficit, providing a market for British manufacturers after the destruction of its own industry, as well as the troops for its colonial conquests, and of course the opium that was the staple of British trade within, with China. The experiment, as it was called in Bengal, has been followed by many others, quite typically with similar results, although nobody draws any conclusions from that. Uh, I'll give a just turn to a contemporary example and quite an illuminating one, namely Brazil. Uh, by the 1920s, the Colossus of the South, as it was called, was hailed by the U.S. press as a mighty realm of limitless potentialities. No territory in the world is better worth exploitation than Brazil's, the Wall Street Journal pointed out perceptively in 1924. Uh, after World War II, the United States was able to take complete control, kicking out the British. Uh, the, uh, uh, the United States at that time was very much in favor of an, what they called an open world, but with, with a closed hemisphere inside of it. The closed hemisphere, the U.S. already controlled, so there was no need for that to be open. Uh, and uh, the open door was not to be applied in Latin America and the Middle East. That's U.S. turf. The rest of the world, not yet under U.S. control, was to be open. Uh, the results are reviewed in a highly regarded scholarly work by Gerald Haynes, who's the senior historian of the CIA. I didn't actually know there was such a position until I read the book. Uh, the U.S. goal, he says, was to eliminate all foreign competition from Latin America, to maintain the area as an important market for U.S. surplus industrial production and private investments, to exploit its vast reserves of raw materials and to keep international communism out, although U.S. intelligence, he notes, could find no indication that it was trying to get in. Uh, international communism is just a code word for people with the wrong ideas. Uh, the U.S. sought to prevent what Washington called excessive industrial development, which he explains means competing with U.S. industry. Industrial development, I'm quoting, must be complementary to U.S. industry while guaranteeing American profits and dominance, and of course ample profit remittance. Competition with foreign capital, say British or Canadian capital, was con not considered excessive and therefore allowed. Uh, agricultural development was promoted as long as it avoided what he calls destabilizing programs like land reform, uh, relied on U.S. farm equipment, and fostered commodities that complemented U.S. production and created new markets for U.S. agricultural commodities. Uh, Brazilian desires were secondary, he concedes, although uh, it's useful to pat them a little bit and make them think you're fond of them, as John Foster Dulles put it. Uh, what U.S. planners envisioned, he says, but seldom stated, was a neo-colonial relationship with Brazil furnishing the raw materials for American industry and the United States supplying Brazil with manufactured goods. They, the Americans pursued a neo-colonial, neo-mercantilist -merc policy, which, he explains, is a classic liberal approach to development. That just shows you how supple an instrument economic theory can be in the right hands. U.S. leaders, he says, used Brazil as a testing area for modern scientific methods of industrial development, another Bengal in short. For example, U.S. Ex US experts encouraged uh, Brazilians to open up the Amazon to development and to follow the U.S. model of railroad operation, uh, the latter perhaps a touch of black humor. But crucially, they provided Brazil with very sincere advice on how to benefit U.S. corporations. In fact, the account, if you read through it, is interlarded with such phrases as the best of intentions, sincerely believed, and so on. By lucky accident, what was sincerely believed conformed quite nicely to the interests of U.S. investors, however ruinous it might be to our little brown brothers. Uh, Haynes again strikes traditional chords, including the 
endless faith in the benign intent that so miraculously serves self-interest. Another goal, he points out, was cultivating the Brazilian military, which U.S. officials promoted as the protector of democracy. This far-sighted program to achieve our democratic vision came to fruition in 1964 as the generals took command, terminating Brazil's post-war parliamentary interlude and instituting a neo-Nazi national security state with ample torture and repression, uh, inspiring their counterparts throughout the hemisphere to do the same, it's kind of notable illustration of the domino theory, one which for some reason is never mentioned when one brings that up. Uh, they followed approved neoliberal doctrine, again under con uh, continued U.S. tutelage, and created what was called an economic miracle that was greatly admired, though there were some reservations about the statistic, sadistic violence by which it was instituted. The brilliant achievements of the generals and the right-thinking technocrats made Brazil the Latin American darling of the international business community, uh, Business Latin America reported in 1972. Arthur Burns, who was chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, was also full of praise for their miraculous work. Uh, as the Chicago boys were invited in by another collection of fascist killers uh, a year later after the overthrow of Allende in Chile, uh, Chicago school economist Arnold Harberger held up Brazil as the exemplar of a glowing future under economic liberalism, uh, Latin American economist David Felix report, reports. It was true, and people recognized that the miracle had a few flaws. Uh, over 90% of the population lived under conditions of increasing misery, for many of them comparable to Central Africa. I'll omit examples, which I presume you know. But profits flowed, and the tiny elite was doing fine, and macroeconomic statistics were quite okay, so it was an economic miracle in the technical sense. Uh, Haynes is writing in 1989. Uh, he describes the results of more than four decades of U.S. tutelage and dominance as a real American success story. America's Brazilian policies were enormously successful, he writes, bringing about impressive economic growth based solidly on capitalism. This triumph of capitalist democracy stands in dramatic contrast to the failures of communism, although admittedly the comparison is unfair to the communists who had nothing remotely like the favorable conditions of this testing area for capitalism with its huge resources, no foreign enemies, free access to international capital and aid, and benevolent U.S. guidance for half a century. And the success is indeed real. From the early years, Haynes writes, U.S. investments and profits boomed as Washington intensified Brazil's financial dependence on the United States, influenced its government's decisions affecting the allocation of resources, and nudged Brazil into the U.S.-dominated trading system. If the conditions of Eastern Europe are beyond the wildest dreams of much of the population, that's the way the cookie crumbles. We should not underestimate the scale of the achievement. It took real talent to create a nightmare in a country as favored and richly endowed as Brazil. And in the light of such triumphs, which can be duplicated over much of the world, it's entirely understandable that the rulers of the new imperial age should be dedicated with such passion to helping others share the wonders and that the ideological managers should celebrate the accomplishment with such enthusiasm and self-praise. Well, such is the way with experiments. They don't always succeed, except for the designers. It's another one of those puzzling ironies of history that bemuse the well-behaved intellectual. The essential point about all this was actually perceived by Adam Smith in one of the many parts of his classic work that nobody bothers to read. He argued that monopolistic companies and colonies had a grievous impact on others and were harmful for the home country as well, that part you read. But he went on to say that our merchants and manufacturers have been by far the principal architects of policy and their interests have been most peculiarly attended to by the system, though not the interests of consumers and working people. In short, the costs were socialized 
and the profits poured into the coffers of the principal architects. Well, that too is a lesson that carries over into year 501. Uh, Adam Smith's emphasis on the crucial element of class conflict is only one of the many interesting features of his thinking that have been filtered out as it's been converted into an instrument of domination and oppression. Uh, state power also played a major role in development at home, uh, especially in England, from the days of the massive expropriation of the peasantry uh, and on. There's a recent, quite an interesting recent study on this by John Brewer, a historian of England, who points out that Britain's emergence as what he calls the military wunderkind of the age in the late 17th and early 18th century coincided with, um, all these are quotes, with an astonishing transformation in British government, one which put muscle on the bones of the British body politic. Contrary to the liberal tradition, Britain in this period became a strong state, what he calls a fiscal military state, thanks to a radical increase in taxation and a sizable public administration devoted to organizing the fiscal and military activities of the state. The state, he points out, became the largest single actor in the economy, one of Europe's most powerful states, judged by the criteria of the ability to take pounds out of people's pockets and to put soldiers in the field and sailors on the high seas. Lobbies, trade organizations, groups of merchants and financiers fought or combined with one another to take advantage of the protection afforded by the greatest of economic creatures, the state. Uh, that's Brewer. The role of the state was not merely to conquer and to conduct experiments. Uh, it also acted to promote exports, to limit imports, and in general to pursue the protectionist import substitution policies that have opened the way to industrial takeoff from England to South Korea without any exception that I've ever heard of. The same is true of the United States, uh, from textiles through steel to modern electronics and pharmaceuticals and biotechnology. The state has been called upon to protect private capital from the destructive impact of free markets, to organize a huge public subsidy, and to provide a state guaranteed market to cushion management decisions. It's a role that's been played primarily by the Pentagon-based system in past years. Uh, there's now much concern in the United States, you read about it all the time, uh, over the need to find other measures to guarantee the system of public, uh, public subsidy, private profit, that's proudly called free enterprise, now that the possibility of appealing to the great Satan to justify the traditional method is, has been lost. The uh, crucial role of, state, of the state in what's late development has been widely recognized by economic historians since the work of Alexander Gershenkron about 40 years ago. The East Asian model is one familiar case. There's a major study, and a very interesting one, by 24 leading Japanese economists uh, who review the decision by the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, MITI, uh, right after World War II they decided to disregard prevailing economic theory and the advice of their economic advisors and instead to assign a predominant role in the formulation of industrial policy to the state bureaucracy in a system that they say is rather similar to the organization of the industrial bureaucracy in the so-called socialist countries. The, this radical defiance of economic precepts, they point out, set the stage for the Japanese miracle. And Western specialists do not disagree. Uh, one of the leading conservative Japan experts, Chalmers Johnson, describes Japan as the only communist nation that works, because they were efficient instead of corrupt. Uh, the pattern, in fact, is exceptionless, as far as I know. Economic success has invariably relied on activist policies that deliberately alter market incentives. There's a very extensive recent scholarly study by Hollis Chenery and others uh, which reviews the point, comparative study, and it points out that periods of significant export expansion are almost always preceded by periods of strong import substitution. You look at the exceptions, you see they really prove the same point. That is, state intervention in violation of the market. These conclusions are important to bear in mind as you observe the measures that are now being employed to keep the third world in its place uh, now including Eastern Europe, which is being restored to its traditional role. 
Uh, true, those who expect to win the competition are going to laud the wonders of free trade. So everybody knows that Britain was a great advocate of free trade from about 1846 up until the late 1920s. Uh, it became an advocate of free trade after it had smashed up the competitors uh, and created its industrial revolution. And uh, to put it in modern terms, the playing field was leveled, uh, namely uh, vertically, which is the way it's supposed to be leveled. Uh, in the 1920s, however, uh, Japan unfairly began to produce more cheaply and efficiently, at which point Britain effectively closed off the empire, empire followed by the Dutch, the Americans, and the French, uh, an important part of the background for the Pacific War. Uh, the US preached the principles of free trade selectively, as I've just indicated, after World War II for much the same reasons, until US hegemony declined in what is these days called a tripolar world economy. Uh, Reaganite conservatism, as it's called, doubled the percentage of imports subject to protectionist measures among other devices of state intervention, which were in fact among the most protectionist in the world uh, in the 1980s. Uh, aid to dependent mothers succumbed to so-called conservatism, but aid to dependent bankers and steel executives and electronics firms flourished. In fact, throughout, the corporate sector has insisted on massive state subsidies to maintain private power and privilege. That was a lesson that was learned by the corporate managers who flocked to Washington to run the essentially totalitarian wartime economy that in fact finally pulled the US out of the Great Depression. Uh, belief that capitalism might be a viable system has long disappeared apart from the remote margins uh, and of course the mainstream doctrinal system which naturally seeks to subject intended victims to its destructive impact. But the successful economies will not hear of it and never have which is why they're successful. By World War II, US planners were well aware of their unprecedented economic and military power, and they intended to use it to organize the world in the interests of the social sectors that they represent. At home, uh, the population are considered ignorant and meddlesome outsiders who must remain spectators, not participants in the political system quoting Walter Lippmann and other progressive thinkers as they developed a suitable democratic theory for the modern age. The economic system must observe pure totalitarian principles with the rabble restricted to the role of rented tools and passive consumers. Uh, it was also necessary at that point to reverse the first and the last legislative victories of labor in the mid-1930s and to dismantle the organizations and the threat of democracy that they posed. That's at home. Abroad, the industrial societies were to be reconstructed along similar lines. That was a major task of the early post-war period as the traditional conservative order was largely restored, including fascist collaborators, while labor and the anti-fascist resistance were weakened and marginalized as much as possible with great violence when that was necessary. The great workshops, as they were called, were to be Germany and Japan, restored to conservative business rule and under US control. Now that plan required that Japan be provided with its empire toward the south, as George Kennan put it. He was the chief of the State Department policy planning staff and one of the leading architects of the post-war world. And Germany had to be partitioned with the rich industrial areas kept under unilateral Western control and protected from what the British Foreign Office called economic and ideological infiltration from the East, which is something very like aggression. Uh, political set successes by the wrong people are commonly described as aggression in the uh, Orwellian language of the internal documentary record. So in Japan, a potential victory of labor, which everybody's afraid of, would have been, as they put it, concealed aggression by the Russians. Uh, in Vietnam, the United States was fighting what uh, the Kennedy administration described as internal aggression, that is, aggression by South Vietnamese peasants against the US troops who were trying to defend their country from them, and so on throughout. The South throughout was to be restored to its service role, and in fact, there was sophisticated planning. Each area was given its particular role. Africa was to be exploited 
quoting Kennan again, exploited for the reconstruction of Europe, Southeast Asia was to fulfill its main function of providing raw materials and markets along with uh, Latin America. Middle East resources were to be managed by what British imperialists had called uh, the Arab facade that could be trusted to serve the interests of the masters. For the third world generally, a 1948 CIA memorandum observed, it would be necessary to strike a balance between supporting local nationalist aspirations and maintaining the colonial economic interests of Western Europe, uh, and there could be little doubt as to the relative weights when serious interests uh, were at stake. Well, as global manager and global enforcer, the United States perceived the main threat to all of this as what were, called, what were commonly called radical and nationalistic regimes that are responsive to popular pressures for immediate improvement in the low living standards of the masses and development for domestic needs. These are quotes. Tendencies that conflict with the demand for a political and economic climate conducive to private investment with adequate repatriation of profits and protection of our raw materials. And so if this sounds like some 10th rate Maoist tract, that's because uh, the most vulgar Marxism is absolutely standard uh, in the internal planning record and the business press with, of course, the values reversed. Uh, I'll, I'll spare you similar things. Uh, radical and nationalistic regimes are intolerable in themselves, uh, even more so if they appear to be succeeding in terms that might be meaningful to oppressed and suffering people. Uh, in that case, there's another couple other technical terms that come along. In that case, they're called a virus that might infect others or a rotten apple that might spoil the barrel. Of course, not by conquest, but by the demonstration effect of successful development. So when Henry Kissinger warned that the contagious example of Allende's Chile would infect not only Latin America, but also Southern Europe, he did not I think, anticipate that Allende's hordes would descend upon Rome. I say I think because the extent of his ignorance and stupidity is hard to <laughs> exaggerate, but I don't think he had that in mind. Uh, rather, I assume that what he meant was that Italian voters would uh, get a message that democratic social reform was a possible option. The Sandinista revolution without borders was a spectacularly successful government media fraud but the propaganda images did reflect an authentic concern. From the perspective of a hegemonic power and its intellectual servants, declaration of an intent to provide a model that will inspire others, which in fact is the actual source of the imagery, does amount to aggression, much as the British Foreign Office understood in the late 1940s. Uh, when a virus is detected, it has to be destroyed naturally, and potential victims have to be immunized. The Cuban virus called forth invasion, unprecedented international terrorism, and economic warfare, all of which of course continues, and a rash of national security states, as in Brazil, to prevent the rot from spreading. And much the same was true in Southeast Asia in the same years. Uh, a notable example which gives great insight into Western civilization was the euphoric welcome that was afforded to the huge slaughter in Indonesia in 1965, which really has to be read to be believed. The standard approach to the virus itself is a two-track policy, as in the case of Allende's Chile. The hard line called for a military coup, which was finally achieved. The soft line was outlined by uh, Ambassador Edward Corey, a Kennedy liberal. Uh, he explained, we must do all within our power to condemn Chile and the Chileans to utmost deprivation and poverty, a policy designed for a long time to come to accelerate the hard features of a communist society in Chile. So even if the hard line did not succeed in exterminating the virus, the vision of utmost deprivation should keep the rot from spreading and ultimately demoralize the patient itself. And crucially, it provides ample grist for the mills of the commissars who can produce cries of anguish at the hard features of a communist society, pouring scorn on those apologists who describe what is in fact happening. The very same model was applied to Cuba and Nicaragua. It was extended after Cold War pretexts had to be abandoned, simply showing their utter irrelevance. Uh, in the Cuban case, in fact, the policies go back 170 years 
another fact that has to be obscured by the cultural managers. Well, to introduce some further technical terminology, this is mostly advice for those of you who are looking for professional careers, and so you catch on. Uh, rotten apples constitute a threat to what's called stability. So as Washington prepared to overthrow the first democratic government in Guatemala in 1954, a State Department official warned internally that Guatemala has become, I'm quoting, Guatemala has become an increasing threat to the stability of Honduras and El Salvador. Its agrarian reform is a powerful propaganda weapon. Its broad social program of aiding the workers and peasants in a victorious struggle against the upper classes and large foreign enterprises has a strong appeal to the populations of Central American neighbors where similar conditions prevail. So stability, in short, means security for the upper classes and large foreign enterprises, and naturally it must be preserved. Uh, again, such thinking is pervasive and understandable and entirely independent of the Cold War. Uh, after the Gulf War, when the Cold War was lost as a pretext beyond hope of redemption, George Bush returned to support for his old friend and ally, Saddam Hussein, as he crushed the Shiites in the, in the south and then the Kurds in the north. Uh, Western ideologues explain that although these atrocities offend our delicate sensibilities, we must nevertheless accept them in the name of stability. The chief diplomatic correspondent of the New York Times again, Thomas Friedman, outlined Bush administration reasoning. Uh, Washington, he wrote, seeks the best of all worlds, an iron-fisted Iraqi junta without Saddam Hussein, a return to the days when Saddam's iron fist held Iraq together, much to the satisfaction of the American allies, Turkey and Saudi Arabia, not to speak of the boss in Washington. Saddam Hussein committed his first serious crime on August 2nd, 1990, when he disobeyed orders. Therefore, he must be destroyed. You're not allowed to disobey orders. But some clone has to be found to ensure stability. Uh, incidentally, while Britain is agonizing over the curious sudden discovery of what was always known, namely that Britain and the United States were arming their good friend Saddam Hussein, uh, the compartmentalized British mind is able to overlook the fact uh, that Britain is right now the major military supplier to an absolute clone of Saddam Hussein, namely General Suharto, who's using British aid to crush, uh, to, to, to consummate the genocide in Timor, among other pleasant actions. But you can't expect the commissar class to get that into their heads. Uh, the communist danger to uh, stability is further enhanced by their unfair advantages. The communists are able to appeal directly to the masses, President Eisenhower complained, again using the standard vulgar Marxist rhetoric of in internal discourse. Our, plan our plans for the masses uh, preclude any such appeal. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles uh, de ad he added to this, he deplored what he called the communist ability to get control of mass movements, something we have no capacity to duplicate. The poor people are the ones they appeal to, and they have always wanted to plunder the rich. That's the <laughs> gravest problem of the modern era. Uh, the same concerns extend to the preferential option of, uh, to the, for the poor of the Latin American church and other commitments to independent development or democracy. And they also extend to our old friends like Mussolini and Hitler, and Trujillo, Noriega, Saddam Hussein, when they forget their assigned roles. Uh, although major themes are persistent and will continue into year 501 and beyond, policies do have to be adapted to changing contingencies. There was a change in world order of lasting importance that was recognized officially in August 1971 when Richard Nixon dismantled the international economic order that had been established after World War II in which the U.S. served in effect as international banker. Uh, German-led Europe and Japan had recovered from wartime destruction and the U.S. was facing the unanticipated costs of the Vietnam War. The world economy was entering into a period of tripolarity and also of stagnation and declining profitability of capital. One perfectly predictable reaction from the early 1970s was a rapid intensification of the class war that is 
waged by the corporate sector, its political agents, and its ideological servants. Uh, the years since, the last 20 years, uh, have seen an attack on real wages, social services, unions, indeed any functioning democratic structure, so as to overcome the troublesome crisis of democracy, as it was called, that was brought about by the illegitimate efforts of the public to bring their interests into the political arena. In Central America, one can send out the death squads at home where subtle means are required. Uh, another objective is to establish a de facto world government which is devoted to the task of ensuring that the world's human and material resources are freely available to the supranational corporations and banks that are to dominate the new imperial age. Uh, its operations have to be insulated from popular awareness or interference. It's taken for granted that not very many people are going to follow the internal deliberations of the GATT negotiators or the IMF with their enormous impact on global society and, of course, not the transnational corporations and international banks and investment firms which are immune to inspection and which dominate production and commerce and conditions of life worldwide in a system of internally managed trade. Um, classical economic theory, a firm is considered an island of central management in a sea, in a free market sea. By now the islands are approximately the size of the sea uh, and the sea itself has little resemblance to free market ideology. Uh, an interesting example of this is the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, that's now being consummated in North America. Uh, it's going to have very large scale consequences and it's quite intriguing to see how it's being handled. It's, uh, you can't be quite certain about what its consequences are because it's secret. Nobody knows what's in it. Uh, it, but it's pretty clear that it's going to be a bonanza for investors and probably a disaster for workers and the environment. It's an executive agreement. The text was even withheld from uh, a union-based labor advisory committee, which is required by law to review such measures. It was withheld until one day before the report was due and then still largely kept secret. And that's a striking example of the utter contempt for democracy on the part of the so-called conservatives, which is, believe it or not, even greater than that on the part of the so-called liberals. Congress abdicated responsibility. Citizens know nothing. Uh, in such ways, we can approach the long-sought ideal, uh, formal democratic procedures that are utterly devoid of meaning, as citizens not only do not intrude into the public arena, but scarcely have an idea of the policies that will shape their lives. The point, in fact, is far more general. By now, people have scarcely any idea what's happening around them. There's an interesting academic study that just appeared about the presidential election in the U.S. It reports that less, that less than 30 percent of the population was aware of the positions of the candidates on major issues, although 86 percent knew the name of George Bush's dog. Actually, I, to my amazement, I mentioned this on Swedish radio in an interview right after the election. And before I got to the last part, the Swedish announcer intervened. Oh, you said, oh, you mean Millie. You know. uh, <laughs> uh, but the general propaganda does get through. Uh, when people are asked to identify the largest element of the federal budget, less than a quarter gave the correct answer, which is military spending. Almost half select foreign aid, which you can barely find. I mean, it didn't even exist. The second choice was welfare. Uh, which was chosen by a third of the population, who also far overestimate the proportion that goes to blacks and the child support. Uh, and although the question wasn't asked, you can be sure that virtually no one is aware that so-called defense spending is in fact in large measure welfare for the rich. Another result of the study is that the more educated sectors were the more ignorant, which is not surprising since they are the main targets of the indoctrination system and they are also the ideological managers so they have to be have instilled in them the right ideas, namely the proper falsehoods. Uh, Bush supporters who are more, the best educated scored lowest overall uh, on factual judgments. Now the public is not unaware of what's happening. Although with the success of the policies of isolation and breakdown of organizational structure, the response is erratic and self-destructive. Faith in billionaire saviors, uh, myths of past innocence, and 
all sorts of fanaticism mixtures that have not had happy consequences in the past. In this general framework, the Cold War can be understood in large measure as an interlude in the North-South conflict of the Colombian era, uh, unique in scale, but quite similar to other episodes in its basic logic. Even before Columbus, uh, Eastern and Western Europe were diverging, in fact, along a fault line that goes right down uh, Germany. Uh, the Bolshevik takeover quickly eliminated any socialist elements, but it was radical nationalist. It was a threat to stability in the technical sense and had no little appeal elsewhere. In short, the Soviet Union from 1917 was a gigantic rotten apple. Uh, now, and naturally, it called forth the, uh, not the usual reaction, including immediate military intervention. Now, of course, there are other pretexts. So if you take a look at, say, the George Kennan scholarly history of Soviet-American relations, he writes that it was the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly in January 1918 that created the breach with the Western world with an element of finality. Uh, the British ambassador uh, was deeply shocked, he said, and uh, uh, promoted armed intervention from that point on. Woodrow Wilson was particularly offended. Uh, a few months later, Wilson's invading army dissolved the National Assembly and occupied Haiti by genuine Marine Corps methods, in the words of the Marine Commander Smedley Butler, Major Smedley Butler, the reason was that Haitian legislators uh, had refused to ratify a constitution imposed by the invaders that gave them the right to buy up Haiti's lands. Uh, there was then a marine-run plebiscite that remedied the problem, arranging for the constitution to be ratified with 99.9% .9 approval, uh, with 5% of the population participating. Uh, Accordingly, Wilson is revered as a great moral teacher and the apostle of self-determination and freedom. Uh, the Bolsheviks, in contrast, had violated our high principles and had to be overthrown by force. Following the same high principles, the U.S. enthusiastically welcomed the fine young revolution carried out in Italy in 1922, as the American ambassador described it, well into the 1930s, Mussolini was that admirable Italian gentleman, in the words of the man who took credit for the Constitution forced on Haiti, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Fascist atrocities were acceptable because they blocked the threat of a second Russia, the State Department explained. Hitler was described as a moderate for the same reason. In 1937, the State Department saw fascism as the natural reaction of the rich and middle classes in self-defense when the dissatisfied masses, with the example of the Russian Revolution before them, swing to the left. Fascism, it said, must therefore succeed, or the masses, uh, this time reinforced by the disillusioned middle class, will again turn to the left. Uh, as you doubtless know, that conception is now being revived by ultra-right and neo-Nazi German historians, and will doubtless be the accepted doctrine of the future, given its utility for power interests. A host of other murderers and torturers were placed in power and supported uh, for on exactly the same grounds. Uh, the actual logic of the Cold War from 1917 was much the same as in the case of Grenada or Guatemala, although the scale of the problem was vastly different. The situation became more dire after 1945, when traditional Eastern European service areas were removed and the virus reached such a level of military power that it actually had a deterrent effect, lending tar assistance to targets of U.S. attack. It's kind of interesting to see how the problem of this oversized rotten apple was dealt with in policy making, led to some curious contortions. Uh, there was a major secret study of July 1945, recently declassified, in which planners tried to put a satisfactory gloss on the U.S. intention to take control of the world and surround Russia with military force while denying the adversary any rights at all beyond its borders. Uh, that may seem to be open to the criticism of being illogical, they worry. But the criticism, they explained, is only superficially plausible. The reason it, it's the U.S. plan, they said, is a logical illogicality. It's one of my favorite phrases. The reason is that by no stretch of the imagination could the U.S. and Britain be thought to have expansion, expansionist or aggressive ambition, but Russia is different for the following reason. 
there, I'm quoting, there's a rising tide all over the world wherein the common man aspires to higher and wider horizons. And we cannot be certain that the Russians have not flirted with the thought of associating themselves with this criminal conspiracy, pursuing the commie tactic of appealing to the poor who have always wanted to plunder the rich, as Dulles later put it. In other words, only when it has clearly adopted the principle that the rich men must have their way everywhere may the Russians be allowed to enter the servants' uh, quarters. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind that there was no concern over, no high-level concern over Russian aggression, and furthermore, crucially, that Western leaders were completely untroubled by Stalin's awesome crimes. Truman, for example, wrote that he liked and admired Stalin, thought he was honest and clever, and thought that he could deal with him, and Eisenhower and others agreed. Uh, what, went, what went on in Russia was not his concern, uh, Truman declared. Stalin's death, he wrote in his diary, would be a real catastrophe. But he added a, a crucial footnote. Uh, Stalin Russian uh, cooperation was contingent on the U.S. getting its way 85% of the time. Uh, in short, as usual, the problem is not crimes, which can be as awesome as you like, but insubordination. That's a fact that has been made clear by a host of gangsters from Mussolini and Hitler and Stalin up to Saddam Hussein. Uh, for such reasons, the U.S. had little interest in resolving the Cold War conflict. It's getting late, and I'll skip the history, but in fact, it's true right up to the present. This, uh, unless you could return them to the service role. Short of that, no kind of settlement is even worth thinking about, and there were many opportunities. It's not in doubt any longer. The Soviet Union reached the peak of its power by the late 1950s, always far beyond the West. By the mid-1960s, the Soviet economy was stagnating, and standard social indicators were beginning to decline. By the late 1970s, military spending was flattening, and the autocracy was unable to control rising dissidents. The command economy had, in fact, carried out basic industrial development, but it was unable to proceed to more advanced stages, and it also suffered from the global recession that devastated much of the South. By the 1980s, the system collapsed, and the core industrial countries, which were always, always, always far richer and more powerful, won the Cold War. Much of the Soviet empire will probably return to its traditional third world status, with the old Communist Party privileged class, the nomenclatura, taking on the role of third world elites linked to the uh, international business and financial interests, which is in fact exactly what's going on right now. Uh, throughout that period, great efforts were undertaken to present the Soviet Union as larger than life, about to overwhelm us. By the late 1970s, Soviet decline was absolutely unmistakable, but there was rising hysteria about the gargantuan Soviet system, uh, leaping from strength to strength, straddling the globe, challenging the U.S., even threatening its survival, establishing positions of strength in Laos and Grenada and Mozambique and other such crucial centers of world strategic power. These uh, delusionary efforts were accompanied by much fantasy about Soviet military spending, which have since been exposed as utter, utterly false and quite likely outright fraud. Uh, going on too long, so I'll save you some other things. The collapse of the Soviet empire offers a num quite a number of opportunities to Western power, along with the restoration of East Europe to the traditional service role. Uh, for one thing, it offers crucial opportunities uh, to establish the North-South divide more firmly within the rich societies. One aspect of globalization of the economy is globalization of the third world two-tiered model. They go together. It's corollary. Uh, a couple of months ago, the chairman of Daimler-Benz warned the huge German conglomerate uh, warned that if there were further strikes, the corporation would transfer manufacturing facilities elsewhere, uh, in particular to Russia, with its ample supply of trained and healthy and, it is hoped, docile workers. The chairman of General Motors uses similar threats with regard to Mexico and other sectors of the Third World, and incidentally, Eastern Europe. There was a nice article about this in the Financial Times the other day which pointed out that while GM plans to close 21 plants in the U.S. and Canada, 
It has opened a huge $700 million assembly plant in East Germany with great expectations, heightened by the fact that thanks to over 40% unemployment, workers are willing, I'm quoting from the Financial Times now, workers are willing to work longer hours than their pampered colleagues in Western Germany at 40% of the wage uh, and with few benefits. Uh, the point is that capital can freely move, people can't, or in fact are not permitted to, by those who applaud Adam Smith's doctrines, which required free movement of labor, of course, uh, apply them when it suits their fancy. The U.S. press also bitterly assailed the striking German <coughs> workers last spring for what it called their soft life, long vacations, and general lack of understanding of their place as instruments for the rich and the powerful. Uh, the idea is that they should learn the lessons that were taught at the same time to American workers by the Caterpillar Corporation. Uh, profits and productivity were up, wages were down, the right to strike was eliminated uh, by the resort to scabs, permanent replacement workers, uh, returning the U.S. to the situation of a century ago when the admired philanthropist Andrew Carnegie destroyed the world's, this country's largest union at Homestead by bringing in scabs protected by the Pennsylvania National Guard. That victory enabled them to slash wages, impose 12-hour workdays, eliminate jobs, gain monumental profits, a magnificent record, it was called, that was to a great extent made possible by the company's victory at Homestead. It's a historian of the world's first billion dollar corporation. The same victory cured the region of the dread threat of democracy as working people were afraid to speak, let alone organize, for fear of being blacklisted and starvation, uh, if not direct state violence, of which there was plenty. These conditions, in fact, were not overcome until the Great Depression, and they're now being restored. Uh, and so the world should run in accord with what Adam Smith called the vile maxim of the masters in one of his many denunciations of capitalism, all for ourselves and nothing for other people. Uh, this Caterpillar strike in 1992 is a historic event, uh, as was the Homestead lockout a century earlier. It's the first time in 60 years that a major corporation has felt powerful enough to use the ultimate weapon against a very substantial union, the United Auto Workers in this case. These are the results of a fierce corporate campaign that was undertaken as soon as American workers finally won the right to organize in the mid-1930s after long years of bitter struggle and violent repression, which are completely unmatched in the industrial world. In fact, the violence was so extreme that it even scandalized journals like the London Times. Uh, you can draw your own conclusions from that. Uh, that victory for working people and for democracy sent a chill through the business community. The National Association of Manufacturers warned in 1938 of what it called the hazard facing industrialists and the newly realized political power of the masses. Uh, unless their thinking is directed, we are definitely headed for advers adversity. And a major counteroffensive was very quickly launched, accelerated after the elite concerns that were aroused by the crisis of democracy of the 1960s, and it has had quite significant success. The results of it are neatly captured in a New York Times headline a couple of weeks ago in the business section, which reads, Paradox of 92, weak economy, strong profits. America is not doing very well, the article opens, but its corporations are doing just fine, with corporate profits hitting new highs as profit markets margins expand. Just a paradox, inexplicable, insoluble. And it's one that will only deepen as the architects of policy proceed without interference from meddlesome outsiders. What the paradox entails for the general population is demonstrated by numerous studies of income distribution, real wages, increasing poverty, including starvation, infant mortality, and so on, in cities and in rural areas that are coming to compare in these respects to the third world and, of course, the, richest, the world's richest country with extraordinary advantages. Uh, overall, the 1980s have accelerated a global rift between a small sector enjoying great privilege and a growing mass of people who are suffering deprivation and misery. The internationalization of capital that accelerated since 1971, breakdown of the Bretton Woods system, also gives a rather new 
character to uh, competition among natu national states. Just to cite one indication, the U.S. share in world exports of manufacturers declined about 3.5% from 1966 to 1984, but the, U but the share of U.S.-based transnational corporations increased during this period. And international trade patterns reveal quite a different picture if imports from overseas subsidiaries are counted as domestic production. In fact, foreign affiliates increased their share of total exports of manufacturers by U.S.-based firms from under 18% in 1957 to 41% in 1984. There's a 1992 World Bank study that reports that intra-firm intra trade, meaning centrally managed trade inside a particular firm, within the largest 350 transnational corporations contributed about 40% of total trade. Those are the islands and the alleged free trade sea. Uh, more than a third of U.S. trade is currently between foreign affiliates and their U.S.-based parents, that is, internally managed trade. And current figures are surely higher from these, which in fact are from a decade ago. As a social entity, the country and most of the population may decline, but the corporate empires are playing quite a different game based on the theological doctrine that the masters have the right to make investment decisions unencumbered by the concerns of their servants and the workplace and the community. And with some, somewhere around maybe a third of world trade already conducted within North-based transnational corporations, these are factors of growing importance as we look forward toward year 501. Uh, the tendencies toward the new imperial age that are heralded by the international financial press are obvious and understandable along with the corollary, the extension of the north-south divide to the inhabitants of the rich. But there are counter tendencies. Throughout the north, notably in the United States, a great deal has changed in the last 30 years, at least in the cultural and moral spheres, if not at the institutional level. If the quincentennial uh, of the old world order had fallen in 1962, it would have been celebrated once again as the liberation of the hemisphere. In 1992, that was impossible, just as no diplomatic historian today could write about our task of felling trees and Indians and get away with it. There's ample evidence also that Washington is well aware of the domestic constraints uh, that virtually rule out state violence, traditional intervention. The ferment of the 1960s reached much wider circles in the years that followed. It elicited new sensitivity to racist and sexist oppression, to concern for the environment, respect for other cultures and human rights. One of the most striking examples is the Third World Solidarity Movements of the 1980s uh, with their very broad social base, in fact right through middle America in this case, and their unprecedented engagement in the lives and fate of the victims. That process of democratization and concern for social justice could have large significance. Well, these developments are perceived to be dangerous and subversive by the powerful, and they're bitterly denounced, as we read every day in the press and journals. And that, too, is understandable. Uh, these developments do threaten the vile maxim of the masters. And they also offer the only real hope for uh, the great mass of the people in the world, even for the survival of the human species in an era of environmental and other global problems that cannot be faced by primitive social and cultural structures that are driven by short-term material gain and that regard human beings as mere instruments, not ends. Thank you. and uh, Noam has very kindly agreed to answer these. Uh, before, and just while you're thinking of what those might be, I have 
Uh, two further announcements. Um, one is that the Raymond Williams Trust will be organizing next spring, um, around Easter time, a seminar on his work, including a seminar where themes uh, connected with the nature of imperialism in the current world and the uh, uh, cultural distortions that that has produced work in the theme of books of his like The Country and the City uh, will be taken up and developed. If you're interested in this, could you please write to Graham Martin, Professor Graham Martin at the Arts Faculty at the Open University and you'll be sent further details. Uh, also, if you're able to make any contribution to the Trust, that would be gratefully received and you should send it to Professor Graham Martin, at Arts Faculty, the Open University. Uh, and just another thing that I might observe is that I understand that uh, um, Noam Chomsky will be interviewed by John Pilger uh, on The Late Show this evening, I think that's right. So uh, uh, I'm sure your appetite has been whetted by this uh, <laughs> tremendous discourse, uh, uh, so pointed, so precise, such an indictment. Uh, could I now ask for questions? Oh, that's the Lectures on Philosophy of History, his final work, you know, the summation of his thought, 1830, 1831. Um, what would you say about the post-industrial society, post society being another myth that's been created in the uh, imperialist power, mm. where you can actually produce very little productive wealth, yeah. but the majority of the population somehow um, can live off services? Yeah. What, is, is there a myth of the post-industrial society where you can produce very little, you can produce great wealth but with little of the population productively employed? A uh, great part of the population is productively employed. It's just employed in Papua New Guinea and uh, high repression areas. The idea is to, sh the, the effect of the, there has been, I mean there's always been multinational corporations, you know, of course. But there's been a very rapid acceleration since the breakdown of the international economic system in the early 70s. Very rapid acceleration. Now, there are other factors that contributed to it too. So, uh, and, and that's what's indicated in some of the statistics that I mentioned. So you now have internally managed trade in a kind of corporate mercantilism, as it's sometimes called, where the labor is moved to high repression areas. Uh, so that you don't have to worry about those pampered workers at home, as the Financial Times puts it. Uh, and in fact, this is a shift, it is a kind of, if you, I don't know if post-industrial is the right term, but there is a shift of models. I mean, there was a kind of a Ford, Henry Ford style model, where the idea was, you've got it, production was basically, na the economy was more or less national, not totally, of course, but more or less national. And that meant you had to have consumers to keep profits up. So Ford innovated the idea of paying workers enough so that they could buy something, uh, and that would enable manufacturers to make profits. Now, I think there's a shift away from that uh, towards production by workers who don't have to buy anything, because they're mostly either in the third world or in the third world that's coming back at home in the United States and to a certain extent in Britain, where you can have high repression, unorganized workers who really are not, and, if, and they're never going to organize because you kill the organizers or something like that. Uh, and if they try, you just bring in others who will replace them because there's a huge overflow as you drive people off the land and so on. Uh, now, they're never going to be consumers. So who are going to be the consumers? Well, uh, in the internationalized economy, there are rich sectors everywhere, fairly substantial rich sectors in the industrial societies and smaller but not insubstantial uh, uh, rich sectors in the third world. So, you know, you go to a typical third world country, say Brazil, after this great, you know, success story for capitalism, and say 5% of the population or something like that live at approximately the level of, you know, Western European elites, maybe richer sometimes. And, you know, 80% live like, you know, Central Africa. Now, in a rich society like, say, the United States, the proportions will be different course, but the structure is becoming more or less the same. And the idea is that the poor people everywhere will be the wealth producers, and the rich people everywhere will be the consumers. And the domestic societies, uh, the domestic uh, countries will be essentially police forces 
controlling their own populations, while the major decisions about the world economy and world society are made by the international corporations and financial institutions and the de facto world government, which is growing in a quite natural way to reflect their interests. That's the new imperial age of the financial times. Uh, the the uh, decisions are raised to the level of supranational institutions where parliaments can't influence them and citizens don't know about them. The problem with parliaments is that although they're more or less controlled by the same interests, they are to a limited extent subject to the influence of the rabble and you want to eliminate that as you destroy democracy totally, which in fact has always been the aim of elites. I mean, there are kind of dreamy fantasies going around about history with a capital H converging to a liberal democratic order. I mean, this, this isn't even fantasy. Continuing Chinese occupation of Tibet? No, it's an atrocity, but we ought to look at its history, in fact. Why does China occupy Tibet? Well, one reason is because in the 1920s and the 1930s, the Western imperial powers insisted that China occupy Tibet. Uh, they wanted China to dominate the surrounding areas, Tibet, Manchuria, and Mongolia, uh, because it was assumed that China's in our pocket. It's one of the, China's been open to Western exploitation ever since the British opened it up in the Opium War forcing them to take a British lethal narcotics because there was nothing else they wanted. Uh, and ever since then, China has been a plaything for the West. And it was assumed in the 1930s that that was going to continue. So therefore, China ought to be as large as possible to uh, be a proper market. And therefore, the West insisted on something which was by no means natural, namely that uh, Manchuria, uh, uh, Mongolia, and Tibet be incorporated within China. Well, later something happened in China that the West didn't like that much, but they were stuck with what they had uh, achieved. But uh, yes, it's an atrocity, like most occupations. Sorry, I thought you said something basically positive towards the, end, at the very end of what you were saying. Yeah, I meant I to. I didn't, didn't quite, I mean, perhaps you could enlarge a little bit of that, because I think I could almost missed it. <laughs> yeah, well, at the, at the end, very rapidly, so much so that she almost missed it. Uh, she thought she caught a note of something positive. Uh, <laughs> and actually, uh, that's extremely important. I mean, it, the United States, and in fact much of the world, is completely different culturally and morally than it was 30 years ago. The effects of the 60s revo uh, revolutions were enormous. I mean, you see them in every imaginable respect. Uh, uh, and the rulers are terrified of it. I mean, that's why you have these tantrums now in the press about what they call political correctness. They're sort of right. You know, there are a lot of people around who don't believe in racist oppression and in sexist oppression and who have respect for other cultures and think you ought to care about other people and who are opposed to violent aggression and who don't like sadism and terror. I mean, all of these monsters are, in fact, running around. Uh, that wasn't a problem 30 years ago. They weren't running around. But now they're there, so naturally the commissar class is becoming totally hysterical. That's, they, they've tried very hard to get rid of them, and they can't. I mean, take, say, the Vietnam War. Uh, for the last 30 years, there's been unremitting propaganda in the United States to portray the Vietnam War, and in fact the whole history, as an atrocity by the Vietnamese against suffering Americans. I gave a couple of samples, but it's uniform. And if you sample the educated classes, everybody sees it like that. You go to the general population, and they are totally out of control. Uh, there's regular polls, because business wants to keep its finger on the public pulse so you know how to do propaganda and stuff. The latest on this issue, 1990, 71% uh, of, of the population regards the war, given a set of choices, as not a mistake, but fundamentally wrong and immoral. Among educated sectors, it's statistically undetectable, such a position. And that 70% of the population is people who have never heard it expressed. Everybody who answers that question must think I'm the only person in the world who thinks this, because they certainly never read it anywhere. All they read is it was a noble cause that went awry and you know, maybe came a mistake and so on, but nobody believes it. The population is just out of control. And it's the same on every issue. I mean, when Anita Hill made, brought her charges, uh, it, the whole thing turned into a catastrophe. But just imagine what would have happened if Anita Hill had brought those charges forward 30 years ago. 
I mean, nobody would even bother to laugh, you know. I mean, yeah, sure, that's what things are supposed to be like. Well, now they couldn't. The Senate tried to suppress it, but they couldn't, you know, it leaked out, and they had to pretend to face it. Of course, they didn't, but they had to pretend because the population is like that, and it's like that on every issue. In fact, the last, just the day of the opening of the ground campaign in Iraq, there was a leak of a very interesting document. It was hidden, but it was there, and it was interesting, a Bush administration planning document from the early days of the Bush administration. And here's what it said. It said, in the case of confrontation with much weaker enemies, meaning anybody that we're willing to fight, you obviously don't fight anybody who's going to shoot back if you want to. What's called a military hero is somebody who sits in an air-conditioned office somewhere, shuffling around papers while his troops murder people who can't shoot back. That's the definition of a hero, like Norman Schwarzkopf, the British equivalent, his name I've forgotten. Uh, the, uh, uh, so in the case of much weaker enemies, it says we must not only defeat them, but defeat them rapidly and decisively because anything else will undercut political support, recognized to be completely thin. Now, you know, there is a traditional pattern of intervention. It goes way back. Traditional intervention means you send the Marines to occupy Haiti for 20 years or to chase Sandino around in the hills forever, you know. Or you send, like you do like John F. Kennedy did, you send the U.S. Air Force to start, to start bombing South Vietnam to smithereens. That's traditional intervention. It's not even an option anymore. I mean, the only options today are clandestine warfare, which is clandestine means secret from the population at home. Clandestine warfare is just a sign of fear of the population. It's not secret from anybody else. You know, think about cl what clandestine operations are. They're not secret to the victims. You know, they're not secret to the big network of states around the world who are participating in them. In fact, they aren't even secret from the press, except they're <coughs> low enough levels so they can pretend not to know it. They're secret from the domestic population, and you only resort to inefficient clandestine terror if more efficient direct terror is not available. That's why there was such a sharp increase in and, in, in complexity of clandestine terror during the Reagan years. They know the population won't accept it. So that's one option. And the other is rapid, decisive victories over much weaker enemies when you're guaranteed that they're not going to shoot back. And those are the only options. The, the so-called war in, in the Gulf, which was not a war, of course. A war means you got two sides shooting at each other. The Gulf slaughter, as we ought to call it, uh, met those conditions. First, you demonize the enemy, you, know, you terrorize the American population. Then you go in very fast, destroy everybody before, and with a guarantee that no one will shoot back, and that you can get away with. But that's you know, not nice for the victims, but uh, it's a very sharp narrowing of the options. And this is true of everything. The quincentennial is a very dramatic example. When they were planning the quincentennial, they were planning a, a celebration of liberation. It, there was so much popular protest, they had to back off. It then became uh, an encounter. It was about as much of an encounter as the encounter between the Germans and the Jews in Europe in the 1940s, and plenty of the population understands that too. So the whole thing just turned, just collapsed, couldn't do anything. You know? Well, that's a sign of cultural improvement. It's even reached the educated sectors to a limited extent. So for example, up until the 1960s, Remarkable, but true. Up until the 1960s, even scholarship, you know, anthropologists and people like that, were completely suppressing the history of what happened in the United States. I mean, it was possible for a leading diplomatic historian to talk about felling trees and Indians, and nobody batted an eyelash. You know, yeah, okay, felling trees and Indians. Uh, you, uh, that, uh, now it's impossible. They had to start telling the truth about what happened, which was, of course, mass genocide. <laughs> Uh, and it's not that they found new evidence. You know, the evidence was always around. It was just suppressed. Uh, and, and it's coming out, and there's a fair amount of understanding. Uh, and that's true of lots of other areas. You know, that's really important. Those are tremendous changes. Now, they have no institutional reflection. You know, the, the, the great genius of American and British society has been to isolate individuals enough to make people so isolated, you know, that they can't do anything, okay? They're all sitting there somewhere. Uh, the, the, you may have seen this the other day. There was a study of the European community, you know, life patterns, how long do people sleep, and all that kind of thing. And one of the, uh, one of the questions they asked is how long people watch TV. Britain broke the record. 
you know. 90% uh, of the population, I think it was four and a half hours a day of TV watching. Well, that's the perfect way to isolate people. You can have complete freedom, you know, uh, everything, all democratic rights, absolutely perfect, as long as every person is glued to the tube, you know, <laughs> so you can't talk to anybody and you can't get together and you can't pool your resources. And you may have your own crazy ideas in your head, you know, like in your own head you think, yeah, yeah, the Vietnam War was an atrocity, but as long as that is, happens, you can have democratic forms, and that's what's being achieved in the advanced industrial societies. That's what's being called the triumph of liberal democracy. But, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. I mean, unions and other popular organizations were created in the past under much more violent and repressive conditions than exist today, with a lot of struggle, and it can be done again. And you don't have to have uh, the vile maxim of the masters that Adam Smith deplored, not necessary. You can go after the core issue, which classical liberalism also deplored, namely wage labor, which was regarded as atrocity by classical liberals in the 18th century, if you look back. Uh, yeah, you can go after that too, which is another form of uh, oppression and autocracy. Uh, there are lots of possibilities if, this, if these broadly based popular movements can manage to overcome the fact that they don't have resources and that they are scattered and that they're isolated and there are very little ways of communicating with one another and so on. Sure, it can happen. So, so in other words, without the prop of anti-communism, which has been the basis for the propaganda system for actually 70 years, how can paper, I think you mentioned the independent, but in fact any paper, uh, continue to localize uh, the atrocities on some particular enemy, okay? Well, you know, the same way they did before 1917. There actually was a history before 1917, and if you look back, it was the same, you know? I mean, nothing happened during the Cold War except new pretexts. I mean, new methods of mobilizing people. Say, take the United States, which I know better than England, so I'll talk, take the United States. Uh, when Woodrow Wilson sent the Marines uh, to occupy Haiti and the Dominican Republic, which was no joke, incidentally, you know, they massacred people, they reinstated slavery, as I mentioned, they threw out the constitutional system. Uh, and placed and sold the country off to American plantations, it has yet to escape. That's the reason why Haiti and the Dominican Republic are still horror chambers. They're pretty rich countries. Uh, when he did that, there were, no, there were no Bolsheviks around. It was 1915 and 1916. So he was defending the U.S. from the Huns. Uh, before that, uh, uh, it, uh, the, the U.S. Navy was defending uh, the United States from Chile, believe it or not, in the 1990s, uh, 1890s. Uh, before, for, before that, it was mainly defending him from England. Uh, and the way, it, if you, you want to understand how these things work, you ought to look at the U.S. record on England. England was despised, you know. It was regarded as much worse than the treatment of Russia. Uh, this goes way back to the uh, late 18th century. Uh, the idea expressed by the founding fathers, John Adams and others, was that uh, England will always be our enemy until we are her master. Uh, the takeover of Texas, when the U.S. took Texas in the, under the Jacksonian Democrats, the major motive was to try to monopolize cotton. Cotton was the, in those days like oil is today. You know, it was the main commodity in world trade and it's what got the industrial, it was the main factor in the Industrial Revolution. So the idea was that if the United States could control cotton. Britain was very strong then, you know, like the British fleet was a deterrent. The U.S. couldn't conquer Cuba, you know, couldn't invade Canada, all these things it wanted to do because the British power was too great. The idea was that if the U.S. could monopolize the production of cotton, which they figured they could do if they took Texas, 
we can not only bring England to our feet, but we can bring the entire world to our feet. You know, uh, uh, I mean, the, the worst charges against Saddam Hussein were in fact real about the Jacksonian Democrats in the 1840s, uh, if you look back. And it was mainly England that was the enemy that we had to defend ourselves again. Actually, this led to some more comical examples too, if you like. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, back around 1785, was trying to figure out, or 1790 and so on, was trying to figure out what it was that made the English character so insusceptible to civilization, as he put it. Uh, and he decided the problem, he was a scientist, you know, so he decided that the problem was probably that the English ate too much animal food. Uh, and he therefore concluded that maybe the uh, solution would be uh, in their kitchens, not in their churches, as he put it. Uh, and in fact, a couple of years later, he strongly supported the French, he was hoping the French would conquer England, presumably assuming that would improve the cuisine as well as the character. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and it just goes on uh, from there, you know. So Britain was, tr was the enemy which inspired even more hatred probably than, uh, uh, than uh, Russia today. It's not like this was reciprocated, except in the case of the British attitude toward the United States, it was contempt rather than, f you know, fear. So for example, just to give you one example, in uh, I guess around 1870 or so, some benefact, rich benefactor offered Cambridge University a bequest for a, a lectureship in American studies, which is kind of like as if somebody offered them a bequest and, you know, I don't know, I can't even think of an example, so absurd. Nobody could imagine why you should study this. Uh, but he offered them a bequest in American studies, and the idea was that uh, every other year a, uh, they should get a Harvard professor over to talk about, you know, this colonial culture over there. And there was a big debate about it in Cambridge. They finally voted it down. Uh, uh, and the fear was that if they brought a professor from Harvard, you got to read this to believe it, he would stir up subversion among the, uh, the uh, 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 undergraduates. Uh, and uh, in fact, one of the dons, one of my favorite lines, how did he put it? He said, if we do this, there's going to be a biennial flash of transatlantic darkness. That's, 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 and they weren't going to take any chances with this, so they turned it down. You know. uh, so they, you know, the problem went both ways. But it's never hard to conjure up enemies. You know. I mean, you go back to the Declaration of Independence, which is one of the most disgraceful documents on record. Uh, the U.S., the founding fathers were describing how they were defending themselves against the merciless Indian savages whose known way of warfare is to massacre women and children. Okay, maybe by the 1950s people had forgotten it, but they knew the truth. They knew that it was the merciless European savages who had to teach the native people uh, the, the European way of warfare, namely you wait till the men leave the village and then you go in and you slaughter the women and the children. They knew it because they were doing it, but they could say it anyway. Uh, and in fact, we've been able to read it for 200 years without batting an eyelash over it. So, you know, conjuring up enemies is a job that the commissars are very good at. Is something that also naturally grows over into a critical, vigilant stance against the arrogance of power and against the corruption of all the channels of communication, discussion, and public debate which is such a ominous feature of public life, not only in um, Britain, but also in the United States. Raymond Williams, of course, himself put forward bold proposals for democratizing the media, not by enlarging the power of the state, but by empowering people from below uh, and by empowering communicators and releasing them from the tutelage uh, of commercial interests and uh, of uh, the interests of power holders. I think Raymond Williams saw this as a particularly key area because he felt that democracy itself, democratic life, was in danger of atrophying in its formal bodies, in Parliament, uh, in Congress, uh, and, and other such institutions. And that's why he put such great emphasis on the need for a democratic revitalization of the means of communication. And that's why he himself also uh, participated 
as a public intellectual, a responsible intellectual, speaking out on the great issues of the day. Well, it need hardly be said that uh, Noam Chomsky has been doing that, and doing that uh, uh, for more than three decades. Um, many of us remember his tremendous essays at the time of the um, Vietnam War, and the huge role he played in gradually awakening a critical spirit, uh, even in the most unlikely places in the United States uh, in the late 60s, the middle and late 60s. In subsequent decades, and including on occasions when um, the going was even more difficult, Noam has been a vigilant eye and um, a strong voice against oppression, injustice, above all the oppression and injustice supported by his own government, or the government, that is to say, of the United States, and by the West more generally. In Nicaragua, and perhaps one should mention most recently and memorably for all of us, the occasion uh, two years ago when the governments of the United States and Britain unleashed the Gulf War. Now, in Britain, as in the United States, this evening will be the fourth Raymond Williams Memorial Lecture. The trust which has organized four of these memorial lectures invites someone who they feel is working in the spirit of Raymond Williams or whose work uh, uh, he would have wished to see encouraged and honored and so far, um, we've had four of the annual lectures, and also in the spirit of Raymond Williams, we've organized some outside London. Uh, in fact, there have been three outside London and four of the annual lectures here uh, in London uh, itself. Um, previous givers of the memorial lecture have been Edward Said, Gwynalf Williams, Marina Warner, and outside London, Umberto Echo, Terry Eagleton, and Stuart Hall, who've given lectures in Glasgow, Kiel, and Cardiff. Um, well, this evening, it's our very great pleasure and honor to introduce Noam Chomsky to give this fourth memorial lecture. And I, I would just like to say a little bit uh, not because Noam Chomsky needs any introduction, but because we do feel that he is extraordinarily well placed to give this memorial lecture, and we do feel that uh, uh, in inviting him to do so, we are encouraging precisely the type of courageous public intervention of which Raymond Williams so warmly approved and which he himself uh, also undertook. Uh, I, I think I should say, to begin with, that we also perhaps felt that there was even some affinity in the work of Raymond Williams and Noam Chomsky, even though it, it, it is in different fields. And I suppose it would be this, that in the work of both of these great scholars, one does see a commitment to the extraordinary potential that lies in ordinary people. And one can see that this can give rise either to great work of cultural criticism, uh, or uh, in the case of Professor Chomsky, uh, to his uh, 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 innovative uh, uh, revolutionary work in the field of linguistics. But um, this commitment to the potential of ordinary people states we're just passing through a period where through a chapter of accidents, through events entirely outside the control of the government, um, a court case has gone wrong, and apparently it's discovered to great amazement that uh, the British government was covertly breaking its own supposed embargo on the dictator Saddam Hussein, uh, against whom it launched uh, that ferocious attack. And um, of course, at the time it was arming Saddam Hussein, it was perfectly well known uh, that he'd been gassing Kurds, uh, oppressing uh, uh, oppositionists inside his own country. 
I think many of you may remember Noam Chomsky's splendid essay that was printed in, our, in, in The Guardian in the run-up to the Gulf War, which exposed this and many other hypocrisies long before we've had the confirmation which has uh, so lately arrived. Well, uh, I don't wish to say any more by way of introduction. I know that um, Noam Chomsky is speaking tonight on the year 501. I think this is a reference to uh, the first year after the 500th centenary of Christopher Columbus, uh, which has been marked by many of us as an event which shows the dark side of the spread of the West and its global power and influence, uh, and which also requires of us a critical spirit. Well, uh, 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 I'm also pleased to say that Noam Chomsky's book, Deterring Democracy, uh, is now available in paperback, and I think even some copies can be uh, purchased at the door. Uh, I think that the title of the lecture he has chosen this evening is linked to the theme of his next book. So, uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Noam Chomsky. <laughs> I was going to talk about the 501st year of modern philosophy, but I guess I better shift given what you just said. Uh, the, uh, the year 1992 uh, poses a critical moral and cultural challenge for the more privileged sectors of the world dominant societies, as, of course, as Robin mentioned, we enter year 501 of the European conquest of the world. And how that challenge is addressed, I think, is likely to have quite fateful consequences. Uh, in recent years, the subjugation of the, the South, as it's now euphemistically called, the subjugation of the South has intensified. The gap between the rich and the poor has doubled since 1960. This is largely a consequence of the neoliberal policies that are have been imposed on the traditional colonies. Uh, while 20 out of 24 industrial countries are more protectionist today than they were a decade ago. Uh, the World Bank has recently estimated that the protectionist measures of the industrial countries, which are keeping pace with their free market bombast, uh, reduce the, nat the national income of the South by twice the amount of official so-called development assistance, which is itself a form of export promotion. Uh, the South Commission may call for a new world order, as they called it, that will respond, quoting, to the South's plea for justice, equity, and democracy in the global society. But that plea is sure to remain unanswered, short of major changes where, powers, where power lies. What will be heard and has been heard uh, is the vision of the new world order uh, uh, of George Bush, who borrowed the same phrase a few months later uh, as part of the rhetorical cover for the U.S.-British uh, war in the Gulf. This is the new imperial age, as the Financial Times recently called it, uh, with a global system, paraphrasing the Financial Times, a global system orchestrated by the group of seven, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, the GATT, and their corporate financial constituencies, uh, a major feature of the era that we are now entering. Now, by the term Europe, when I speak of Europe's conquest of the world, I, of course, mean to include the English settled colonies, one of which now leads the crusade, uh, and also the Japanese. I borrow here South African usage and describe the Japanese as honorary whites, uh, rich enough to almost qualify, at least. Japan was one of the few parts of the South uh, that joined the core with core industrial societies with some of its former colonies in its wake, having been able to avoid the doctrines that are applied to ensure the subordination of the traditional colonies, which are sometimes called free trade or structural adjustment or our noble ideals, uh, from which we, of course, are exempt and always have been. Uh, Adam Smith took 
the discovery of America and that of a passage to the East Indies, according to be the two greatest and most important events recorded in the history of mankind, which certainly made a most essential contribution to the state of Europe, opening up a new and inexhaustible market that led to vast expansion of productive powers and real revenue and wealth, so quoting. In theory, he said, the new set of exchanges should naturally have proved as advantageous to the new as it certainly did to the old continent, but that was not to be. The savage injustice of the Europeans rendered an event which ought to have been beneficial to all, ruinous and destructive to the conquered people who suffered dreadful misfortunes, uh, Smith wrote, he revealing himself to be an early practitioner of the crime of political correctness to borrow some of the terminology of contemporary cultural management. Uh, he went on to point out that their superiority of force enabled the Europeans to commit with impunity every sort of injustice. One case that he found particularly appalling was Bengal, a rich and fertile country with advanced manufacturing when the British arrived, already devastated by Smith's day in 1776. Uh, hundreds of thousands die of famine in a single year, he wrote, because of the conditions imposed by the conquerors, which turned dearth into a famine, while officials of the honorable company plow up a rich field of rice or other grain in order to make room for a plantation of poppies for the opium trade, which was one prime source of the huge profits that stimulated the first industrial revolution, along with the lucrative slave trade and robbery of the colonies generally. Uh, these Smith's conclusions a couple hundred years ago are quite well supported by contemporary scholarship. Europeans fought to kill and they had, a, they had the means to satisfy their bloodlust. In the American colonies, the natives were astonished by the savagery of the Spanish and particularly the British. Uh, meanwhile, on the other side of the world, the peoples of Indonesia were equally appalled by the all destructive fury of European warfare quoting all this from a contemporary military historian, Jeffrey Parker. Uh, Europeans regarded all the conquests as small wars, he comments. Its domination of the world relied critically upon the constant use of force. It was thanks to their military superiority rather than to any social, moral, or natural advantage that the white peoples of the world managed to create and control, however briefly, the first global hegemony in history those temporal qualifications.